Hi, I'm Rachel Arndt. I'm the incoming uh, president of the Rochester Optimist Club, and I'm here today with Jerry Lovell, who is the current president of the Optimist Club. I'm also here with Jim Strader and Jack Townsend. Uh, today we're here to talk about the pumpkin project that we have. We've been doing this every uh, summer and fall for how many years now? Six years now. And um, we're here, like I said, to talk about that. Uh, I'll let Jack start by uh, talking a little bit about the actual process that we have. Well, the process starts with uh, start and receive seed catalogs in January and I go through several of them and uh, it seems like every year there's one or two new varieties. This year we're up to 52 varieties out here in this nine acre field all the way from miniatures to specimens that's supposed to get up to a hundred pounds. I get the seeds ordered uh, then uh, when it gets planting time, I took a, turn it over to Jim, and we come out here uh, oh, about the Monday after Memorial Day, and three or four of us uh, get the seeds in the ground, and I'll let you let Jim take it from there. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, production of the um, pumpkins um, for uh, like six years now. Um, uh, actually, we've been doing this for 11 years, but in earnest uh, for the last six or seven years. Uh, Dr. Fritz originally came up with the idea of uh, raising pumpkins and gourds for a fundraising project. It was a great idea. Um, it's grown um, uh, to become 80% of our funding um, for the club. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how we produce the pumpkins, what some of the challenges are, and, um, and that sort of thing. But um, the reason we do all this is so that we can raise money to help kids. And um, Rachel and, um, and Jerry can talk about uh, some of the organizations that we help and how our club is structured. Uh, we'll get into the actual production uh, part of it here in just a minute. I'm Jerry Level, the pres current president of the Optimus Club, and uh, uh, like Jim said, we are fortunate enough that we come up with a pretty good chunk of money that we can use to uh, support things in the community. Majority of the money goes to the local uh, youth and teens of the uh, Rochester area. Uh, money of it goes to the, uh, the schools. We do give uh, seven scholarships a year. We have in the past six years. Uh, they run about $750 a piece. Uh, there's other organizations within the, the school that uh, receive money for their different activities. It's organizations uh, uh, that need money uh, for their activities. They get money from that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we do, we also have a fund that we establish uh, every year for each one of the school buildings uh, there's about four hundred dollars that goes to each building that we hold back into a reserve fund that can be used for whatever needs to be done and uh, this is determined by the school building uh, administration that, for that. Uh, we've got many other organizations that uh, within the schools that uh, come to us asking for funding and if it so meets into our budget, then we'll be glad to help them out to a certain extent. Uh, let's talk uh, with Rachel here a little bit. She can give you some more information. Our, uh, our pumpkin project represents about 80% of our proceeds uh, to, to help and give back to the community every year. And uh, part of, of what we do is we've uh, given money to Woodlawn Hospital for their pediatric unit. Uh, we've also uh, helped support the Compassionate Care Clinic here in Rochester. And uh, one of the, I guess, newest projects of ours is that we have um, merged with a not-for-profit organization that Dan Perkey established uh, in honor of his son, Kenny Perkey, who's a cancer survivor. What we do, it's called the, uh, the Grouchy Bear Project. And we give gun bears to cancer patients um, who are down in, in various area hospitals. And that's, that's been about a year since we've taken that over. And John Little is the head of that subcommittee and he's doing a fantastic job with it. Uh, but that's part of, part of what the proceeds for the, uh, for the pump, from the pumpkin patch go to. I'm gonna talk about uh, marking a little earlier. I mentioned that uh, January we start looking at seed catalogs and and the various varieties that's out there and as you looking out across the uh, field right now you see we have a lot of potential uh, as far as yield and there's where I come in uh, when we get them harvested I even start before we get them harvested uh, uh, in marketing them it looks like this year we're going to be able to probably market 35 40 percent of our 
uh, yield out here and then uh, we'll go to the Bloomin' Corner. They've been so gracious to uh, let us uh, use their uh, lot there and then uh, the parking lot, Dr. Hoff uh, owns that and he's been gracious to let us use that and uh, we, we market uh, our pumpkins. We get various uh, youth organizations to uh, uh, help us man, man the, the booth there and, and, and sell them. Uh, another thing that we do, we put a uh, decorating package together with like a, a couple a dozen corn stalks, a couple bales of hay, various sizes of, uh, of pumpkins, gourds, squash, very colorful. We market them all over the community. Uh, a lot of businesses, we started out with business packages, now it's growing to a lot of residents wants the same package. And so we're just very thankful for the community, for the support you give us. It's, uh, we look forward to it, uh, but we also look forward when it's all over with and we uh, see how many funds we have for, the, for what uh, we've got budgeted for. And of course, all of uh, what you see out here uh, doesn't just happen. Um, it, it takes uh, a lot of effort, and uh, we've learned a lot of things. Um, you know, they say experience is the best teacher. That's why it costs so much, and um, uh, we've had some lessons uh, learned that cost us dearly. But uh, this is a result of um, of a lot of effort. There was um, at least eight or nine um, optimists out here, as uh, Jack said, around Memorial Day. I think it was the 27th of May is when we seeded this crop. Um, you know, through the years we've learned it takes a special planter. Uh, so um, uh, I got two of my sons, uh, Jesse and Matt in the club here, we've uh, built a special planter that um, um, we operate so that we plant the pumpkins about six inches apart. We'll drop two or three seeds, keeps the space in between them, and uh, of course uh, they're in as straight a rows as we can get because um, if the weeds become a problem, we have to cultivate them. Um, we got these uh, seeded here, and um, um, the Bauman and Clausen farm uh, tilled the field for us, and that was very helpful. Um, Jack, or, um, I'm sorry, George Crom uh, came out and sprayed uh, some. Um, uh, uh, herbicide to keep help keep the weeds down. This is uh, the best that we've ever had as far as a lack of weeds, but it's a combination of spraying and um, uh, hoeing of the weeds. The um, Rochester um, uh, High School um, uh, Club came out with Dan um, uh, McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Um, the Honor Society kids came out uh, on the 5th of July, I think it was, and uh, went through the rows and, uh, and hand weeded some uh, of the weeds that had escaped. So it, uh, I wanted just everybody to understand that it takes a lot of work by a lot of people to make this happen. But um, we're going to talk about the production just a little bit. Um, the way uh, the, the pumpkin plant works, uh, of course, it germinates and uh, starts growing, and um, it uh, doesn't do much but just grow. And uh, we fertilize at about uh, two weeks uh, once the plant's up about four inches uh, with uh, triple 12 uh, fertilizer. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, of course, that we do the row thing is that we can just fertilize in a row. There's no point in fertilizing in the aisle. Uh, rows are uh, eight feet apart. And then every six rows, uh, we skip a row, and that's the sprayer lane, so we can take the sprayer out uh, through here, and um, we'll talk about what we spray for later. But um, but we fertilize, um, like I say, at a couple of weeks uh, with triple 12, and then um, we come back about two weeks after that, so, um, you know, three and a half or four weeks after we've seeded, and we give it a, uh, a heavy dose of nitrogen. Uh, the reason these things look so green out here is, is because of the nitrogen. Uh, pumpkins take as much nitrogen as corn does. Uh, corn is a um, uh, grass uh, that you know, uses a lot of nitrogen to occur to curbits, like pickles and all that sort of thing do as well. So uh, that's how you get the plant going. Uh, sometime around the 4th of July, uh, which would be a month after we've seeded, the plants get big enough that they start vining out. Uh, they shoot runners out, and uh, that's when you start seeing the flowers. And the flowers are, um, they come on first are the male flowers. I've got one here that show you what that looks like. Uh, a male flower on a pumpkin plant is going to have a long stem on it. And um, you, if you can see from the camera inside here, there's just a single pistil inside the the flower, um, the male flowers look that way. The female flowers have uh, multiple uh, pistils. And what's got to happen is the pollen from the male flower has to get to the female flower so that there's pollination happens. Um, of course, I've been telling everybody that there's a lot of sexual activity going on out here in Dr. Fritz's neighborhood. And, uh, and that's really the case because um, there's going to be thousands of these uh, pumpkins. And the only way that that's going to happen is every time you have a pumpkin, um, an insect carried pollen from the male uh, flower to the female flower. Uh, you can't see them out here, but there's bees flying around, and um, we've got some bees here that uh, help pollinate these things. Without the bees, no pumpkins. It's just how that works. The female flower gets pollinated, and this is what happens. 
there's a bulb on the end of this. I cut this vine off here just so we could show you. But you see the remains of the flower here. This is the um, uh, flower, the female flower that got pollinated. And this probably happened uh, maybe two days ago. It's not that long. When the female flower first comes on the vine, there's a little bulb that looks like a very miniature pumpkin, maybe half the size of what you see in my hand here. And um, if, it, if it gets pollinated successfully, then this happens. And growth happens really quickly once we get to this point. Uh, pumpkins um, uh, can put on, you know, maybe two pounds or uh, so a day, uh, some of the varieties do. And uh, Jack didn't mention it, but um, when he gets a seed catalog in February, he just kind of goes crazy. And um, this year he got 52 different varieties for us to plant. So we'll have um, a lot of interesting things to, to sell come, um, come fall. But uh, one of the major problems that we've fought over the years is um, fungus. Uh, this year, uh, because of the lack of rain, the fungus pressure was a lot less. This is as good as it's looked for as long as it's looked. Uh, without the water, the fungus doesn't grow very well. But nevertheless, uh, we spray uh, to take care of the, the fungus. The dry weather has um, uh, put insect pressure at a higher level, so uh, we've already sprayed twice for insects. Usually uh, that's it for the whole season, but this year it's going to be three times, um, so we regained on one side, we lost on the other. I just saw a honeybee flying up here, and uh, you, you see this, there's a bee right on the end of the leaf right there. I don't know if the camera can show that or not, but um, the, um, if you come out here in the morning when the flowers opened up, you can see the bees in the, in the different flowers, and um, I, can, I can see them flying around here, but the camera isn't going to show it up. I can see right now, I can see four bees flying, and there's probably a dozen in the flowers right in that area. There, there's that many bees out here. The other thing that a pumpkin plant does, uh, in order to not to get too many pumpkins on the vine, is the flower closes at about noon. So if you're going to see uh, the bees working out here, uh, you want to come out in the morning because the flowers are open. Once the flower closes, the, the female flower, it never opens up again. So um, the uh, plant kind of protects it itself from getting too many uh, female flowers pollinated and putting too much pressure on where it's uh, not able to, to grow the whole, uh, f um, the whole plant um, and, and the flower all, uh, all at the same time to, to get a large pumpkin. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that uh, it takes a lot of work by a lot of people. Uh, we have a number of clubs that come out to help us uh, pick these things. Um, sometime about Labor Day week we'll start harvesting and uh, we've got a special conveyor that we've built that um, the uh, person that picks the uh, pumpkin up off of the uh, field puts it on the conveyor it goes up the conveyor and falls into a uh, large tank of water that has um, uh, has a little bit of bleach in it um, the pumpkin is physically washed to get the dirt off of it the bleach takes care of any fungus that's um, uh, on the um, pumpkin we want to make sure that the pumpkin lasts a long time and then it's put into a big box that we can handle with a skid steer loader called a Gaylord and uh, and that's how we do it but um, I think our record is 22 Gaylords in one night or something like that um, it's it's a lot of work and um, it really helps the club stay um, uh, fresh and viable because when you get people involved um, you know um, well they're involved it's just that simple and uh, it's been a really great project from that standpoint because um, we can have the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes and organizations like the Honor Society Club come out here and work and we donate some money back to them uh, uh, for uh, their efforts. Um, so it's, it's kind of a closed circle that way. So the whole project's been a really good um, a good thing for the club. We're going to keep doing this as long as, um, as, long as we can. Uh, we've been very blessed this year um, in spite of the dry weather. The crop has looked um, really good and um, we're not there yet, but we're optimistic it's going to come out just fine. Okay, as the current president of the Optimist Club, I would like to thank Jim Streeter, especially for uh, getting the crop planted, uh, taking care of the patch, uh, getting the stuff uh, produced for us. And I'd like to thank Jack Townsend, who uh, does the majority of the marketing for the organization. He knows the outlets where we can uh, wholesale some of the product. Uh, he's put together the decorator packages, uh, spends a lot of time getting those put together and decorated. Uh, probably we'll have some of the retail packages and business packages available towards the end of September, 1st of October, something along that line, so that they will be, you know, fresh for the, the holiday season. Uh, we anticipate if there's some organization that would like to have a quantity of pumpkins or something along that line that they need for a particular project why we would like to encourage you to uh, get a hold of Jack Townsend uh, probably could get a hold of him through the Rochester meet in Delhi they would know how how to get a hold of him and 
uh, he could put together some kind of package tell you what we can do as far as costs and prices and things along that line. But I do like to thank these two guys for all that they've done this summer and this past winter in putting this project together. It makes it easy for me as the president of the group to have the funding there to do the things that uh, we would like to do for the kids and for the, you know, for the school and the community. I just like to thank them publicly for doing that. We meet as a club every Monday at 6.45 in the morning at uh, the Duretti's Conference Center. Well, not the Duretti's Conference Center, but the, the uh, Duretti's Conference Room. If anyone would like to come join us, learn more about the club, see what we're all about, uh, we'd, be, we'd, be, uh, we'd be happy to have you. Thank you. We're here by the uh, bee boxes that are uh, in a location adjacent to the uh, pumpkin patch. Um, I have in my hand a female flower. Uh, this flower just opened up this morning and you can see the little bulb that's um, right underneath the flower. It looks like a very miniature pumpkin. Uh, this is a, a flower that needs to be pollinated by the, by the bees and uh, there's a whole lot of that going on out there right now. Um, these flowers have a lot of pollen in them. <clears throat> I mean I'm uh, holding this thing maybe 8 or 10 inches away from my nose and I can smell the pollen. Um, it'll put any uh, rose to shame as far as um, uh, how much um, pollen and nectar it has in it, but that's what it uh, takes in order to attract the bees so that uh, they go in there and uh, get the pollen and the nectar, but um, this is where it all starts. As soon as that flower gets pollinated, it dies, this bulb is going to start growing. It, it's then a, a pumpkin and it keeps growing until, of course, it gets big and orange and, and we pick it. Uh, a bee box is an um, interesting little device. Um, what we have here, this is a hive tool. This is what I use to uh, open up the box and pry the thing apart because the bees are very good at sticking things together. The uh, entrance board down here is where the bees land on. Uh, it gives them an easy place to come in and fly and land just like an airplane needs a runway. Uh, bees need something to land on. The bottom box uh, goes from the board, uh, uh, the uh, entrance board all the way up here to um, uh, this level here. You maybe can't see it, but there's a plastic screen in here that holds, has holes just big enough so that bees can get through it, but the queen bee can't. The queen bee is bigger than every other bee. So we want to keep her down in this bottom box so she doesn't lay eggs and stuff up in the uh, upper part of the, uh, of the box here. Uh, I've got two supers on here. A super is a uh, thing that's very much like the brood box, but it's only six and a half inches tall. And it has uh, ten frames in it where um, the worker bees uh, make home and they put honey in they, they they're storing it for the winter. Um, I put a second box on these here a week ago, um, so this top box is not as full as the one down below it. I only put the second box on when the first box is full. So we'll harvest this honey in um, August sometime. Uh, we've already taken honey off once this year because with the early spring um, we had a early uh, honey flow. Uh, the bees are uh, working very well this morning. You see them flying in and out to the top board here. And if the camera can pick it up, some of these bees have little yellow sacks on the back of their legs. And uh, what they're doing is they're carrying in the pollen. If the camera again shows it, that pollen is exactly the same color as the inside of this flower. And um, so we know that they're working the pumpkin patch. And the fact that they're bringing in a lot of pollen means that there's a lot of young bees, um, larva, inside this um, uh, box. Uh, the bees work by communicating with scent. And the queen puts out certain scents. You know, she knows when... Uh, there's a whole lot of um, uh, larvae uh, uh, in the box and, um, and uh, knows how much pollen is in there. It's um, you know, been a millions of years um, that bees have been around and they've gotten to a level of sophistication that's just amazing. But um, when they need more pollen, she puts that sand out. If they need more nectar, that's what happens and um, uh, she directs traffic uh, literally um, in the bee box. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but a queen bee can't feed herself. Uh, she's dependent on the worker bees to bring um, food to her and um, actually feed her, just like a tube feeder. So um, the, you think the bees in charge of everything, well the worker bees have, um, have a whole lot to do with that as well. So um, we have 10 boxes of the bees out here and there's probably 30 or 40,000 40, bees per box. So if you can do the math uh, pretty quickly, uh, there's a whole lot of bees out there in the field um, going into these flowers. and. Uh, hopefully getting into a male flower first, a female flower second, uh, spreading the pollen to, to fertilize this, um, this flower just by accident. Uh, they, the bees are out there collecting food, uh, pollinating uh, the flowers is just uh, something that happens accidentally. But um, if we didn't have the bees here, all those plants out there that look really great and they're nice and green and growing like crazy, without the bees we wouldn't have any kind of uh, pumpkin crop at all. So it's a very important part of, um, of what goes on. Um, this is the lid of the bee box and you can see underneath there there's a top board and you see all the bees 
that are in the uh, middle there. Now, I can stand here by this bee box and they're not going to bother me because they don't see me doing anything that's going to maybe endanger their brood. If I was to kick this box or something, that would all change. And a scent would go out that is um, an alarmist scent and you can smell it if you're by the bee box. And I know that as soon as I smell that scent, the alarm has been given and um, the bees are going to be very aggressive about um, defending their brood because that's the one thing they'll sting for. Unless you accidentally step on a bee or something like that where you endanger it, uh, they're not going to bother you. Just like I can be here for however long I want to be um, just talking about the bees. But uh, taking that lid off there is a bit of a risk uh, because, you know, the, the vibration in the box, you know, they, they're very um, good about protecting their, their brood because they've got to defend that or, or they're out of business. So um, uh, taking care of bees is not as easy as it might sound like. Uh, it does take a fair amount of work. Uh, the super, when it's full of honey, weighs 100 pounds. That brood box is about 130 pounds, so you have a strong back and um, um, lift things right because you try to pick the brood box and the super full of honey. Um, one person's not going to do that. Um, they're, um, they're, they're very heavy, uh, and you want them to be heavy because uh, if, if you got a lot of weight there, you know there's a lot of honey and uh, brood and all that sort of thing uh, inside, the, um, uh, inside the super, inside the brood box. So. That's what we do uh, to help raise the pumpkins, and um, um, the bees uh, have a whole lot to do with that, and without them we wouldn't have any kind of crops, so um, that's a short lesson on honeybees this morning.